Hello, I'm Donovan Bigelow, and this is a lecture on Edward O. Wilson's On Human Nature. Now, the first question you might ask is, why do we study a writing called On Human Nature for Psychology? And the answer is simple. This is the core of all psychology. The good doctor starts his book, On Human Nature, with a quote from uh, David Hume, the great English philosopher, uh, in his book, uh, An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And Hume understood that the human mind is complicated. And in fact, he recognized that historically we've philosophers, psychologists, thinkers, religious uh, theorists have struggled with what the human mind is, has struggled, I think, with human nature going back thousands of years. And the warning up front is that this is an abstract and difficult idea. Human nature, it sounds so philosophical. And yet Wilson is convinced, and I agree with him on this, that this is the core of psychology. If we don't get human nature right, if we at least don't get close to the reality, the biological reality of human nature, then our philosophical ideas, our psychological ideas, possibly even our mor moral, political, religious ideas are to that extent going to be misguided. Now, Wilson's controversial, um, radical almost. He's written a series of books. Uh, there's a, a collection of three of them. On Human Nature is the third of the of three. The first is called Insect Societies, and the second large primary work is called Sociobiology, and that's really the umbrella under which most of his writings can be placed. Hume describes the study of human understanding as of unspeakable importance, and, it, and I think Wilson is in complete agreement, and he gives us a warning up front that this is going to be uh, a large subject, but he also gives us a warning up front that you're not going to read this text without having much of your own way of thinking challenged. I I'll be honest about my response to it. I initially said that it was the of all the books I've ever read in my life, it's probably easily in the top five. But it's also disturbing. I also disagree with large chunks of it. It also can be aggravating and, and challenging in a direct and quite personal way. And so as I move through the material, my first request of any listener is to take a deep breath and try to withhold judgment until you see it as a whole. He's going to one of the benefits of reading Wilson carefully is I am convinced that he will make everybody angry. He has the ability to to use his science to come to at least tentative conclusions that are going to make everyone on the left and on the right simultaneously angry. And I think that's a unique skill, a unique and valuable skill, and it makes his writings, I think, interesting, challenging, and uh, will absolutely pay off in the long run if you study them seriously and at length. He's attempting in this trilogy to provide a synthesis. I mentioned, I believe, in the earlier uh, evolutionary psychology lecture that the field is new, so new that, that there hasn't been a, an agreed upon name for it. it yes, it, evolution began with Darwin, everyone gets that. But now there's evolutionary psychology, there's sociobiology, population biology, behavioral genetics, a dozen other terms without uh, that seem to be all in the same large basket, but there hasn't been any agreed upon uh, overriding umbrella. Sociobiology is Wilson's attempt to synthesize all of those disparate fields into one, I think, uh, comprehensive syn synthesis of, of human nature. Um, his question, and he has, he has uh, as many questions as he does answers in this text, and I think that's laudable. One of his main questions is, assuming we can consolidate some of these disparate fields, can we integrate science and the social sciences without ideology? Now this is, this is a strange sounding sentence perhaps, strange sounding question. He is a scientist. Of that there is no doubt whatsoever. He is committed to the scientific method. He recognizes that there is a, a gap between the hard sciences, physics, biology, chemistry, mathematics, and the soft sciences, or sciences in quotation marks, social sciences, sociology, 
political science and those kind of things. Uh, psychology, perhaps, has been in the soft science, social psychology uh, side of the house. He's trying to bridge that gap. He wants a scientific social science. He wants to ground sociology, political science, and he absolutely wants to ground psychology in hard science. If he can do that, uh, he's suggesting we can move away from ideology. We can move into a melding, a synthesis of science and the social sciences that will provide a bedrock for better policies, better morals, better ethics. Uh, that's his quest. That's, that's what he's trying to do here. Uh, I think he would agree with Nietzsche in Nietzsche's idea that, quote, all great truths are methods. The scientific method the ability to look carefully at data, the ability to test hypotheses, um, to him is more important than any individual or single discovery. <clears throat> so he wants to, I, I think, be careful that we as, as students keep in mind the difference between a potential conclusion uh, of, of a scientific inquiry and the method by which that conclusion is arrived at. Conclusions are always going to be tentative. He is not claiming some absolute truth here. He's not claiming that he's found gigantic answers to these gigantic questions. But he is privileging his at least tentative answers because they are put through the crucible of the scientific method. And he's challenging everyone else to prove him wrong, to to show by data, evidence, and a rigorous scientific method that, that your ideas are better than his. He's comfortable with an evolutionary competition in some ways, it seems to me. He's humble a little in that he recognizes this is a very young field and broad conclusions are simply unwarranted. We're not there yet. Uh, at most, what he is doing in this text is laying out a method. He's laying out some tentative hypotheses. He's challenging some claims to truth that others have put before him. And I think he's trying at best to raise new and challenging questions for us all. Okay, that's the preface. Um, chapter one. He's describing some dilemmas here, and these these go to the very core of this entire text. Um, the, f the questions that David Hume asked, how does the human mind work? And beyond that, why does it work in such a way and not another? Um, ultimately, what is man's ultimate nature? And right off the bat, he doesn't shy away from controversy. Um, quote, for if, uh, oh, and uh, let me apologize again. This material is so radical and so fascinating and so new that I don't want to impose my own judgment on it yet. I, I want to give you, as much as I can, Dr. Wilson's own take on this. So, unfortunately, I'm probably going to be reading a little more than I'm comfortable with, but I believe it's, it's well worth uh, your patience. For if the brain is a machine of 10 billion nerve cells, and the mind can somehow be explained as the summed activity of a finite number of chemical and electrical reactions, boundaries limit the human prospect. If we are biological and our souls cannot fly free, if humankind evolved by Darwinian natural selection, genetic chance and environmental necessity, not God, made the species. Wow. Right up front, he's challenging the existence of God. And he knows that well over 90% of people on this planet believe in God in some form or another. And so in literally the first two paragraphs of his text, he's not very gently throwing down a gauntlet and saying, let us evaluate our most cherished beliefs. Let us have the courage to take a deep breath and see where these beliefs come from. Is there another explanation for why so many of us believe in a deity or in a creator? Um, the, the question that this ultimately comes to is, is, is his desire to put human nature under the scientific microscope. 
This is the core scientific question to, to Dr. Wilson. Can human nature be laid open as an object of fully empirical research? He wants to take us away from a God-given nature, uh, a theology-based understanding of the human position on the earth, to a purely biological, genetic, human uh, version of that. And, and I, I think it's fair to say that no less than the totality of that is at stake in, in what he's trying to do here. Now, right away, I'm on shaky ground. Right away, uh, this material, and, and it's odd to me that he, maybe he doesn't care. Maybe uh, what other people think. Maybe he's uh, been doing this long enough that he can lay out his, his opinions as honestly as, as he has them um, with, without couching them to, to be gentle with other people's sensibilities. I, I'm not sure what his motivation is, but this is a strong position right off the bat, and I, I suspect he's going to put people off again. Please just be aware of your reaction and give him an honest listen. He appears to be worth reading, at least to me. Okay. Underlying this question of human nature to Wilson is great hope. And that's why I think he's worth listening to, because uh, several times in the text he references the Russian writer Dostoevsky, who said... If God is dead, all is permitted. What most thinkers alive today seem to recognize is that humans, at one level or another, almost must believe in God because without God, all is permitted. Like Dostoevsky says, what rules could we have? Where is morality? How could civilization survive without a belief in, in a God-based ethics and morals? Wouldn't we just all resort to our Cro-Magnon ancestors? Uh, would life be red in fang and claw, uh, like, like Hobbes said? He is suggesting that there is hope in a scientific understanding of human nature. Will it be possible to avoid scientific reductionism in a scientific look at human nature. Can we not hope for a scientific synthesis that ra rises above the mere animalic, the mere animal in our biological nature? He, he ends the text, a little preview, he ends the text with a chapter entitled Hope, and I think, I think that's frankly what warrants our serious consideration of his work. He's not going to leave us um, reduced to mere animal status. I don't, I don't, I'm pretty convinced that he's more optimistic than that. We shall see. Um, right away, in addition to his, to his challenging some pretty sacred beliefs, he also recognizes immediately the dilemmas in that challenge. And uh, just on page two and three of his text, uh, two to five, he lays out the details of his own awareness of those dilemmas. Um, the first great dilemma is if he's right, if we focus not on God but human nature as a biological entity, then what is our purpose here? What gives us a purpose? If there is no God, how is it that we get through our day? What's the end point? Teleology is the phrase for ultimate ends and goals. And he's saying flat out there isn't any. But what then motivates us to get out of bed in the morning? Why love? Why raise families? What's the meaning of our life it is, if, it isn't, if it isn't given to us by God? And, his, and he doesn't give a very good answer to that question other than a sense of our own will and nobility and strength and creativity that challenges us to will our own meaning. This, this strikes a lot of readers similar to, to Nietzsche's ideas, among others. Um, but he, he recognizes it first and foremost as a very dangerous dilemma. If you accept some of these ideas, you're going to have to be personally responsible for the meaning in your own life. This is not an easy challenge. This is an existential challenge at a very profound level. Um, he, I have to admit, he takes his criticism one step further. Troubling. Um, religious beliefs, he claims, are evolved, adaptive results 
of genetic evolution. That it was an advantage to our Cro-Magnon ancestors to have these belief systems. It made them more successful in the competition with those that didn't have them. It gave an identity to the tribe. It gave an identity to the group that was motivating and fostered survival uh, efforts that perhaps wouldn't have been there otherwise. Um, it's, it's almost impossible for us today to wrap our minds around the idea of spiritual, spiritual beliefs as a biologically based activity. It does open the possibility, however, if we think historically of understanding the rise and fall of civilizations. Anyone who studied history for more than 15 minutes knows that every ancient civilization had its own belief in whatever god or gods they had. Those gods now are universally non-existent because those civilizations are non-existent. He's asking even a more broad question than, than the belief in God. What happens if we lose our faith in God, and that has been a significant part of our adaptive cultural legacy? Well, then our culture can fall apart. So he's not simply rejecting a belief in God. He's trying to understand what function spiritual beliefs had in our evolved um, genetic development. But he's also asking a cultural question and thinking of, of that historically. How do you explain the rise and fall of civilizations? He will come back to this frequently, but genetics don't work very quickly. There is Darwinian evolution, which takes place over tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, and cultural evolution, which happens very rapidly, an eye blink relative to the, to the uh, biological genetic evolution. Culture, as it now exists on the planet, is two to three to four thousand years old, depending on how you measure it. Genetically speaking, that's a blink of an eye. And the changes in our culture now are vastly outstripping our genetics ability to keep up. We cannot biologically modify our physical structure to keep track, to keep pace with the pace of modern cultural development. The conflict that that generates in us, he suggests later on, is one of the sources of mental illness, that our biology doesn't match our cultural experience, and frankly, in some cases, not even very close at all. So his, his position on, on religious belief is complex and deep. And, and if, if it's unpalatable in our current existence, it certainly provides a historical way to understand civilizations that have come before us. Um, the second dilemma, which he spends a great deal of time on, which I think is absolutely essential as well. It's one thing to, to privilege the scientific method. It's, it's one thing to claim that rigorous application of the scientific method to human nature will give us answers about who we are and what human nature is all about. That's great. Thank you for that. But what happens when we have to make hard choices? Is he suggesting that we can, through the application of science to sociobiology, come up with moral value judgments, ethics, that we can make political decisions based on a scientific application of sociobiological tenets? He gets that that seems beyond the scope of anything even he aspires to, and it remains a dilemma. He's not answering, the, he's stating the dilemmas. He's recognizing that what he's suggesting is going to evoke these things, and he's only beginning I think, to try to play with potential solutions. These are questions we're going to have to sit with for potentially a very long time. And the challenge, again, is to sit with them, to not foreclose, to not reject, to not uh, abandon the method here as we try to make sense of this radical idea. And I, I think he would respect being uh, put in the category of Copernicus or, or Galileo, who saw the earth going around the sun because of their mathematics and their application of science. But of course they were threatened with heresy and, and, mer and death for such heretical views. No one was comfortable with that, and today it's a commonplace. Everyone knows it's true. Everyone just sort of nods. Uh, 
but back then it was radical and dangerous. I think Wilson's ideas are in those categories. I think now he is seen as dangerous in a hundred years everyone's going to nod their head and and laugh at us for being so uncomfortable with his ideas. I don't know, I'm just playing with this, but I, I think at the very least given the history of scientific development his claims deserve our uh, serious attention. Um, he does again, take his challenge to the next level. Uh, concerning the second dilemma, um, he cites two very famous political philosophers, uh, John Rawls and Robert Nozick. I read both of their the books that he cites when I was in law school a very long time ago. They were considered the cutting edge. They were considered the foundations of two very different visions of human political organization. And Wilson backhands them both uh, summarily, um, he's suggesting that the, that that the entire edifice that these two brilliant and respected thinkers came up with are nothing more than prejudice, nothing more than personal idiosyncratic bias, not a grounded intellectual edifice that we could upon which we could build any meaningful policy choices. He wants to take it deeper. He wants to take it to biology, not merely philosophy, not intellectual efforts. To him, those are misguided, abstract, the dangers that, that David Hume threatened uh, us with, uh, the abstract nature of some of these thoughts. It's, it's one of the reasons philosophy has been so frustrating for students for hundreds of years. They spin these ivory towers of, of intellectual uh, uh, theories, and they seem ungrounded in the real world. What Wilson is trying to do here, and, and specifically in his sort of backhanding of Rawls and, and Nozick, he's saying that if you're going to have a theory of justice, if you're going to make moral and ethical decisions, it had better be grounded in the reality of human biology. If it isn't, you're lost in the clouds. So, um, that's his goal, that's his starting point, to ground human nature in the biology of the sociobiology, the cultural derivatives of human genetics and evolution. I, uh, maybe a third dilemma that he doesn't explicitly discuss too much is uh, assuming we can do this, who's going to decide? I, I, I think he I think he needs to think through, and I don't want to be too critical up front, I just want to get his ideas out here as clearly as I can, but I, I have to admit I'm a little, I have a third dilemma for him, and, and that's the question of uh, science itself and who gets to decide what conclusions the scientific method comes to that we ought to support. I think the recent controversies over uh, global warming is a case in point that ought to make us a little bit skeptical about what scientists claim. Consensus is not science, and and I hope Wilson in his subsequent writings is going to be maintain his claim of sort of rigorous application of the scientific method. Um, more on that later. Um, there's a phrase that he uses called scientific materialism. Materialism, a philosophical idea that talks about privileging existence, life, phenomenology, um, not attempting to explain life through metaphysics or religion or that sort of thing. And he comes flat, flat out and says there must be a, a triumph of scientific materialism, that he expects all the big answers to be handled by sociobiology, if that becomes the umbrella phrase. And good for him, he asks the question, what about art? What about what about the dehumanizing reductionism of science? What's the scientific method? The heart of the scientific method is the reduction of perceived phenomena to fundamental testable principles. Page 11 of his text. That's it. That's the core of the scientific method. The reduction of perceived phenomena to fundamental testable principles. But it's that reduction that seems to be a problem in and of itself when it comes to understanding human nature. I, I think the 
one of the fundamental objections to Wilson is this sense that we all have in our own hearts and minds that we're more than the sum of our genetics, that we're more than the sum of our blood corpuscles, hormones, and the rest, that there's something about consciousness, our minds, that's beyond our brains, that feels more than just the sum total of our biologies. And it leads to the question of, is science dehumanizing? Um, the reductionism of the scientific method is a problem in the study of human nature in a larger context. And his answer to that, I think, is quite clever. He's suggesting that we maintain the, the scientific method, that reduction, but that it's going to be in the synthesis of, of the specific conclusions that, that we come to through the application of the method, not just to our bodies and our genetics, and their evolutionary histories, but also to culture, that he's suggesting that the reductionism of science into its component, uh, the, the, the reduction of the human into its component parts might then be able to be synthesized into a greater whole. Now, I'm getting awfully speculative here, and I don't know if this is going to hold water for you. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be sustainable given what Wilson is saying here, but I think at least he's hinting at, at that being his great hope, that he can overcome the very common ob objection to scientific materialism, to the reductionism of the scientific method as applies to human beings, by this hope. Now, one might object that scientists aren't supposed to hope, but they're human like the rest of us, so maybe this is okay. Um, in the end of all of this uh, speculation, he remains profoundly committed to the study of biology as the core to human nature. Um, he believes that a biological understanding of human nature and the social sciences, all of them, grounded in that biological substrate will provide a richer, deeper, more profound understanding of what it means to be human. And he's on, uh, on solid ground here historically, it seems to me. He cites Alexander Pope, a great literature critic uh, from the 1800s, uh, the, pr the proper study of man is man. And uh, he's also, uh, I think, comfortable quoting Nietzsche's idea that psychology is once again the queen of sciences. Psychology being raised up above physics, chemistry, biology. The idea that, the st that, that, that privileging the study of human nature in this way uh, seems to him to be, and enough great thinkers prior to him, uh, to be a worthy cause, time well spent. I hope you think so. I certainly do. Chapter 2 of the text is called Heredity. We'll move to that now. Um, and he wants to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts. Now, he doesn't, this is not a textbook on the nuts and bolts of evolutionary psychology. That's handled in another lecture with different texts. Uh, but I think he needs to address the basics, and he does, I think, uh, rather well. He notes initially, we live on a planet of staggering organic diversity. Um, and how do we study it? And his response is sociobiology. The systematic study of, bio of the biological basis of all forms of social behavior, a genetics-based social evolution. This would include ethology, the study of whole patterns of behavior of organisms under natural conditions, including animals, most specifically animals. Ecology, the study of the relationship of organisms to the environment. Genetics, the biological properties of entire societies, and I think psychology, the human mind. This is his attempt at synthesis. He thinks that beginning with the idea of heredity and biology, evolution, genetics, all, uh, all of these things can be studied and synthesized into one larger understanding of human nature. He is also directly challenging the people who claim that the human is a construction of our social existence, the social constructivists. These he refutes out of hand. 
Um, and this is one of the things that I think uh, is causing him to be a bit of a controversial figure. If you go back to the 1920s and study the behaviorists, uh, starting with Watson and later B.F. Skinner, they were absolutely convinced that the human was a blank slate, tabula rasa in the Latin. The idea that everything that we are, we are trained into, we are learned, we have behavioral reinforcement that makes us who we are. This, this he says, the scientific evidence now completely refutes. Yes, we learn a lot. Yes, culture counts. Yes, it's important, and it's all based on biology. And we come with limitations. We come with hardwired predispositions. We come with genetically determined assets and, and attributes that though they may be in, in nascent form as we develop through our childhood, they flourish, develop, and limit the choices we have. We, human nature is, is about the biological limitations that of five million years of evolution has left a tribal creature with. We cannot get beyond them very far, he says. So there's, and even in our, what seem to be radically different societies now, our cultures, which don't seem to be connected to our Cro-Magnon tribal ancestry, he points out, and I think rightly here, he points out the direct parallels, even in our post-industrial democracies, with division of labor and technology beyond the wildest imagination of, of those just a few generations ago. He's going to point out, and again, I think rightly, that you can see the tendrils going back. You can see the limitations that biology puts on us. Um, he addresses directly the question of free will. One of the things that makes humans proud is their free will. We can make choices, and we're morally and personally responsible for the choices made in our free will. And he, I have to admit, he refutes that out of hand. We don't have free will. Now, we are not genetically determined like robots, so he's taking a middle ground here. We have a level of free will with, uh, out of which um, we can make choices that we are responsible for, yes, but he's suggesting that the, the biological bedrock of our mental functioning by its nature, limits that free will to a certain level of adaptive, creative functioning in the environments we're in. We cannot do whatever we want. We are not unlimited by our free will. It's a humbling position, and I think it's going to cause a great deal of frustration um, with groups who have a bit of a social justice uh, orientation. He's I was going to say humble um, about what can be done to right the historical wrongs as they're seen now, but I think he's going to take a bit of a tragic position that there are things that cannot be changed and that we need to understand the difference between what we can change and what we cannot. Uh, this to me is the great advantage of his work. Um, I think he would put the social justice activists under the mental illness camp, that they're delusional, that they do not understand their own minds that they have fantasies that are not grounded in reality. This is a harsh challenge uh, of his work, and, and we'll address more of that later. Um, the conclusion, the evidence of a large hereditary component is decisive, he says. A large hereditary component uh, in our human nature. Hereditary component meaning we are in large part a function of our genetic makeup and thereby limited. Um, he, he does hint here, uh, again, in a way that's likely to aggravate uh, several on the political left, um, you could fairly conclude very quickly from his earlier writings that uh, socialism is insanity. The delusion that we can share property equally, the delusion that we are all equal in some moral, ethical, political sense, the redistribution of wealth, for example, I think he would see as anathema, as a, as a sign of mental illness, that, that socialism is by, is by its nature 
completely counter to the genetic propensities that humans grew up with for five million years. There is a direct genetic conflict with our utopian idealism and our biologically uh, genetic-based bedrock. We are not going to gladly and willingly share property with others. We are not going to give to those who are not related kin to us very much of our hard-won property. The Malthusian idea that we breed faster than the resources of any environment allows us to dooms us in some ways to unrelenting, unforgiving competition between all species and utopian ideas to the contrary. Uh, Wilson is saying that that competitive nature in us is biologically based and until we can change our genetic structure that is not going to change and politicians that claim uh, otherwise are potentially dangerous and at the very least delusional. Again, much in our current political situation um, might be worth rethinking in light of Wilson's ideas. So, culture determined by genetics and now going beyond them? Um, repeatedly throughout his text, he's trying to recognize how biology, genetics, determines the specific parameters of all of our cultures. And he suggests that, that there are cultural consistencies across the board. Yes, he looks around and sees people organized in very different ways, in different places, under different environments. Cultural diversity is the norm. We, we live in an astonishingly diverse uh, organi social organizations. And one of the things he cites there historically is one of uh, a, a historian of religion has gone back and looked at all the different diverse cultures in history and suggested there's almost a hundred thousand identifiable different religious belief systems since the dawn of civilization. Um, Wilson recognizes the profound diversity of our cultural achievements, and yet he wants to say that there are consistencies among these diverse cultures that, that he sees as grounded in ultimately human nature and our genetics. The other thing he says that I think is not going to uh, disturb our modern philosophies too much uh, is that we're quite close to a couple of other species. Um, he talks about comparing the DNA uh, of chimpanzees and the other great apes. He talks about using uh, ethology studies to look at the cultures of chimpanzees. And he finds, rather uh, unstartling to him, but perhaps startling to others, parallels between um, chimpanzees and humans. Language, self-awareness, social existence, what you could call a rudimentary culture, tool use, learning, and perhaps most importantly, play. Chimpanzees play. How do you explain that? And then he cites the, the, the clear genetic evidence of a 98 plus percent overlap in the genes of humans and chimpanzees. We are less than 2% different at the genetic level. He suggests that therefore there has been a relatively recent genetic divergence between our two species. How else do you explain 98% overlap in genetic structure? It, uh, the conclusion is inescapable that evolution has branched uh, historically and, and that if we were so unique we wouldn't be uh, almost, almost identical to what he calls our little brothers. Um, on page 32 and 33, he does, I think, an excellent summary of the specific theory of natural selection. Um, and let me quote a little bit from it. The heart of the genetic hypothesis is the proposition, derived in a straight line from neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory, that the traits of human nature were adaptive during the time that the human species evolved, and that genes consequently spread through the population that predisposed their carriers to develop those traits. Adaptiveness means simply that if an individual displayed the traits, he stood a greater chance of having his genes represented in the next generation than, he, than if he did not display the traits. The differential advantage among individuals in the strictest sense is called genetic fitness. Now, I've, I've never read uh, a more succinct uh, 
uh, explanation of, of genetic fitness, of natural selection. He goes on, if the possession of certain genes predisposes individuals toward a particular trait, say a certain kind of social response, and the trait in turn conveys superior fitness, the genes will gain an increased representation in the next generation. If natural selection is continued over many generations, the favored genes will spread throughout the population. That, in a nutshell, is the entire theory of evolution, the entire theory of how we became uh, who we are, how human nature developed into what it is. Um, and he wants to put his own ideas to the same scientifically rigorous methodological testing that he puts everybody else's theories to. He doesn't want science to become a new dogma, and he recognizes that may be the fourth dilemma in his in his writings. How do you how do you, and, and we've again seen some recent uh, problems with this very thing where scientists are held up as if they're virtually um, unquestioned religious figures. That 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 difficulty has yet to be resolved to, to anybody's satisfaction as far as I can tell. So he wants to apply the scientific method to evolutionary theory. He wants to look at the data and see what it says. Um, he looks at things like the incest taboo, which he believes has a direct... It isn't a moral question to him. Incest, horrible thing. It makes people nervous even using the word. But what is it, evolutionarily speaking? How is it that we have this, which what he thinks is an innate, genetically driven, taboo? Every culture has it. It's universal. People that violate this, this taboo are anathema. They're, they're outcasts. They're criminals. They're, they're the lowest of the low in most societies. Where did it come from? It looks like one of those traits that had an adaptive advantage was a biological predisposition to avoid sexual contact that would result in genetic mutation, which is what incest does. And so we are predisposed to abhor incest in the same way we are predisposed to like the taste of fat and the taste of sweets, that it provided an adaptive advantage in our Cro-Magnon ancestry. Um, his conclusion, humans are guided by instincts based on genes. Guided. That's the key phrase. We are not determined in some robotic fashion. I want to be clear about that. Guided. Predisposed towards certain things. We, we have a tendency to like certain things, to dislike certain things. And we then get to choose what's adaptive in the here and now. So in a way, what he's suggesting is a synthesis. That we have free will within the narrow parameters of our genetic predisposition. But it remains free will of a sort that, me that is meaningful. So he doesn't take everything away. He, he's not in the camp that suggests pure biological determinism. On this, he, he, strangely, a scientist who studied insects, who studies uh, hard science, who studies biology and genetics, seems to be saying almost the same thing as Freud did in 1905. Uh, Freud came out with a very... Uh, firm genetic, deter not genetic, he didn't understand genetics the way we do now, but his biological determinism sounds almost identical to Wilson's. It's fascinating when two people from different eras, different cultures, different language languages can come to what feels like a very similar scientific conclusion. Okay. Uh, he asks, what, quote, the delicate question of how much social behavior varies genetically within the human species. Why is that a delicate question? Because we're different. That's what diversity is all about. We do different things. We, we have different uh, predispositions. Some are tall, some are short. S we have different mental faculties. Some are good at some things, some are good at others. But he wants to explain all of that genetically and biologically. His conclusion, the evidence is strong that a substantial fraction of human behavioral variation is based on genetic differences among individuals, and goes on to cite XXY chromosomes, mutations, twin studies. Um, he then touches very delicately and very briefly 
on what he calls the most emotionally explosive and politically dangerous of all subjects, are there genetic-based differences among racial groupings, as well as among population as a whole, seeing humans as a whole uh, over the entire planet. His question, does geographical variation occur in the genetic basis of social behavior? What I think he's citing there is the genetic, the, the behavioral geneticist idea of genetic drift. If human populations throughout most of our evolved existence were isolated, once we as a species spread out from Africa is the most accepted theory now, and populated Asia, Europe, and, and everywhere else, those populations ended up being quite isolated from each other and evolution continued. Are there racially based evolutionary differences because of this genetic drift? He touches on it and that's all he does. Um, so here's his conclusion on the question of heredity. Given that humankind is a biological species, it should come as no shock to find that populations are to some extent genetically diverse in the physical and mental properties underlying social behavior. A discovery of this nature does not vitiate the ideas of Western civilization. We are not compelled to believe in biological uniformity in order to affirm human freedom and dignity. And this is his answer to anyone who wants to use his ideas for prejudicial purposes. He's willing, this is where he synthesizes, and this I think is the great advantage of his work. You cannot use Wilson's ideas to foster a modern version of eugenics. He is not going to tolerate, I don't believe, um, using the genetic research results to foster racism, for example. I don't think he would tolerate that. I don't think he would allow anyone to suggest he thinks that way because he does not clearly. But it requires a much more sophisticated understanding of genetics, evolution, and social organization. And the differentials in human behavior, potentiality, talents, across cultures and across the human species generally. A, a sophisticated understanding of, the, of these things and their genetic and evolved precursors to, I think, wrap your mind around what he's trying to say here uh, adequately. I think a simplistic reading of Wilson will lend itself to abuse. It isn't in his material, um, it isn't justified by the material, and uh, you can take a look at it yourself. Um, and again, his hope comes through. I will go further and suggest that hope and pride and not despair are the ultimate legacy of genetic diversity. Because we are a single species, not two or more, one great breeding system through which genes flow and mix in each generation. Because of that flux mankind viewed over many generations shares a single human nature within which relatively minor hereditary influences recycle through ever-changing patterns between the sexes and across families and entire populations. And that's the key, I think to his to his morally to his ideas being morally acceptable to a modern audience i think that bears rereading several times right well we will now move to chapter 3 development and this doesn't mean child development this means development seen uh, from the perspective of evolution um, and he starts it with a, another uh, potentially quite troubling sentence the newly fertilized egg, a corpuscle one two hundredth of an inch in diameter, is not a human being. Uh, he's just alienated 90% of the committed religious believers in this culture, I think. Um, he does not, and I think he, he fails here. He fails to answer the question, okay, if it's not a human being, when does it become a human being? At what point in the evolution of the fetus into a born child, does he declare it to be human? Um, I had a, a previous lecture on the question of the sufficient neuronal mass in the fetal brain to assume some the existence of some level of sentience, of self-awareness. He doesn't address that at all, and I think it's, it's a problem. He comes out and makes a flat statement uh, and, and leaves it hanging without much scientific support, 
or much addressing of the problems that such a statement inevitably results in. But there we go. Um, a set of unfolding genetic instructions, that's what he considers uh, the newly fertilized egg, 250,000 genes, and the brain, 10 billion neurons connected to a billion sensory nerves. Um, and right away we get into the problem of reductionism. He cites uh, hearing, um, uh, the neural circuitry, where in some manner beyond our present understanding the mind hears the sound. He uses biology to describe the bedrock of human nature, and yet there's a gap. He misses something. Where in the mind do we hear sound? We know the sound comes in, it plays on the inner ear, the bones, there is a neuronal transmission uh, to the brain from the, the neuronal connections between the inner ear and the brain, and somehow we hear something. But nobody has any idea how that happens. And when he says, where in some manner beyond our present understanding the mind hears the sound, we are left wondering uh, something very, very important about human nature. And I think this is where uh, this question of the mind, which is going to come up again uh, very soon, I think, um, where his ideas leave something to be desired. He does not bridge the gap between brain and mind. He accepts that in our current state of knowledge, we do not understand so much that's very important about what it means to be human, about our minds, about how basic things happen, like hearing, uh, seeing for that matter. We don't know how we see. We know that the ocular nerves transmit neuronal signals to, to the occipital lobe in the back of the brain, and we see things, and we understand them, but there's there's not a good genetic explanation for the nuts and bolts of how that happens. Again, he, he confesses to this being a, a young field, and he doesn't have all the answers, uh, but this, this is a, a troubling gap in, in the field, it seems to me. Um, This is an area where he attempts to expand his understanding of the channels of human development into human mental development. Um, he recognizes that we have a hardwired adaptivity. We, he recognizes that we are good at certain things, that we are flexible and adaptive and creative in certain areas, and in others we are fairly rigid, rigidly repetitive and seemingly determined. He recognizes that, that at the genetic level, that's uh, a result of complex combinations of, of genetics. Uh, there are human behaviors that have just a handful of genetics that seem to be involved, others that are immensely complex. He gets that. Um, he also gets wrong, frankly, significant elements of, of mental illness. Uh, he makes a leap from genetics to the idea of some psychological ideas that simply are not backed by modern science, as far as I can tell. Um, on page 58, um, he talks about schizophrenia. A more typical relationship between genes and behavior is shown by schizophrenia, the commonest form of mental illness. I don't know what psychologist he's talking to, but that's just ridiculous. I mean, that statement is is so profoundly wrong. Schizophrenia is a rare disorder. Of all the disorders, it's one of the most rare. People are much more likely to have three dozen different disorders than that one. Um, depression, anxiety, and all of its variations. Um, all At the end of the day, his discussion on, on mental illness comes down to the conclusion that he is, uh, he's willing, uh, the most he's willing to say is that all mental illness is a combination of genetics and environment. That there isn't any one mental illness that you can point to at, with a purely genetic basis, um, nor is there any mental illness that we can point to that is purely a learned environmental result. Uh, this, he, in this, he is completely consistent with the behavioral geneticists, that our behavior, however it's looked at, is always a complex interaction of genes and environment and how that plays out in a given case is complicated, and he doesn't have good answers for that as far as I can tell. Um.
the most he can say is that there isn't a sharp boundary between what's inherited and, and what's learned or acquired through the environment. Um, he does cite language as a, as a good example, I think, uh, citing Chomsky, um, a good example of how we are hardwired, genetically predisposed to learn language. It's very clear now from the research of Chomsky and others that we do not learn language by behavioral learning. It is something within us, a potentiality that is hardwired and genetically based. We are predisposed to take in language in a very efficient way. Uh, language is so complicated, it cannot be learned in the traditional uh, intellectual sense. Um, he then cites Piaget and Bowlby, uh, who are two developmental psychologists who remain quite influential. And, and he agrees with them and much of modern psychoanalytic theory in that at an individual level, the human mind is an accumulation of all of our experience, and now he wants to throw in an accumulation of our experience, and simultaneously and in concert, the evocation of genetic potentialities. Both of these things woven in to an incredibly complex web, matrix of human behavior. He cites um, phobias, incest, taboo, and, and love. And I do appreciate uh, a scientist who will occasionally cite uh, literary figures. He cites James Joyce on the question of love. And it, it makes sense to me, and I appreciate that if you're going to, to analyze human maladaptive behavior, mental illness, uh, and claim that it's got a significant basis in genetics and evolution, you ought to be able to also explain art, love, compassion, uh, all the, the great things that make human life worth, worth living as far as we can tell, these are things uh, that ought to be explained as well. And he makes an attempt at that um, in this chapter. At the end of the day, however, he suggests that love and hate and war and compassion and everything about the current human behavior, everything about human nature as we now understand it, has its source in can be explained by its existence historically as a mutated trait that has an adaptive genetic advantage and that advantage won out over other traits and became the norm in the species. <laughs>